Welcome back to the program. Well, I'm joined now by Senator David Linehelm, key crossbencher. Thanks very much for your company. Okay. All right, let's get straight into it. I want to get your thoughts. Uh, Tony Burke, we were carrying his media conference a little earlier, uh, and he was talking, uh, well, frustrated, you could tell he was, talking about uh, the idea that the lower house are only going to sit for the first two days of this two weeks scheduled Senate sitting period, and he thinks that that's a cop-out, that the Prime Minister is looking to only front up to question time for two days. What do you think? Well, the House controls its own numbers, the government, uh, its own sitting time. The government's got its numbers in the, in the House. Um, why would they want to sit? They've already passed the ABCC bill and registered organisations bill, and that's the reason for recalling the Senate. But know, why come back at all if they're only going to come for two days? Indeed. The only reason really is if the ABCC bill passes the Senate with amendments, then the House would have to then pass it in the amended format. So they have to keep them around. That's, that, that's the only strict reason for being there. Okay. The Senate controls its own sitting time, so the government can't say to the Senate, you must sit for three weeks or three days or whatever. Um, but MPs can't leave then, is that the theory? The theory is that they're there, but there's just no sitting? Is that, is that what we're no. assuming, or they will leave after the two days, physically um, fly out? What happens then if you guys do pass it with amendments uh, on day three? Do they all have to come flying back in? Well, yes, that's a very good question. I don't know that um, I know the answer to that. I think probably the answer would be yes, they'll pull them back again. Mm. Uh, the, I think there's making an assumption that the ABCC bill and the registered orgs bill will be dealt with one way in or the another first two in days. those first two days. My feeling is that um, it's not going to be a knockdown, drag out, screaming match. Either the government's got the numbers or they haven't. Um, they will first of all test it on a procedural basis. So, is it actually going to get uh, admitted to be discussed, so to speak, put onto the notice paper? Well, there was some talk that it might not be. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will now? That's an interesting question. Uh, Labor and the Greens will probably oppose. Although Labor, I'm not sure. I think Labor have started to indicate they might they support might that, and then, of course, then it goes through. I suppose. Here's the key question after that, though. Uh, how, how long will this take? There won't be any filibustering. Right. Uh, the crossbenchers will want to have their say, Labor to some extent as well, and the government perhaps. But it can't last for too long. We're not going to see like what we saw with the drawn-out debate, obviously, around Senate reform. No, we're not going to see that. Um, I've spoken to Labor, and they've said that that's not, that's not the plan this time. I don't know. I mean, the crossbench uh, uh, probably will, uh, some of them at least, will speak on it for 10 minutes, that's all. Typical government and uh, an opposition speech is 20 minutes. That's the maximum. Uh, yeah. We tend to, to be a lot more uh, succinct. I don't think I'll speak on it. Um, it's been through the Senate before, you see, so we've had our opportunity previously. The key question is how it goes at the second reading. I think you're right. I, my feeling is that Labor will allow it to go through to a second reading debate. Um, so they'll support whatever procedural motions are required to allow that to occur. They'll then, it'll then get into second reading debate um, and there'll be a vote on it. Now, I don't think that the government's got the numbers at that point at, this point, at this stage. A lot will depend on how agreeable they are to possible amendments and, and whatever else they have well, to do. Well, what is your sense there? I mean, originally there were some theories around that they won't be very agreeable at all because they want the trigger end of story. Mm -hmm. Polls have shifted. They haven't got a lot of momentum. We'll talk about this whole banking rule. Uh, they're struggling a little bit. We've, they've, they've got dissent in their own ranks on the old, whole idea of the Royal Commission on Banking. Perhaps they will be uh, more interested in agreeing to amendments as long as they can save face but not have to go to an early election now if the PM thinks that, hang on, uh, July 2 is not looking quite as comfy as I once thought. Yeah, I, I think you can, you'll be able to assess the likelihood of a double dissolution based on how agreeable the government is to amendments, if I can put it that way. <laughs> well, and then that then flips over to the crossbenches. Now, I know that you're one who is relaxed about the risk or otherwise of losing your job. You've got something else to go to. Not, not everyone feels as relaxed about that on the crossbench as you do. Um, talk me through some of that dynamic, because uh, if the government looks like it might crab walk away from an early election if amendments are accepted, I could imagine some crossbenchers perhaps being more amenable uh, to what becomes a face-saving exercise for everyone here. They flip on the ABCC legislation from last time. I think you supported it last time. They flip reading, from yeah. last time. Uh, give the government the numbers, avoid the DD election, uh, and therefore extend their tenure in the Senate? I'm, I'm, the only uh, senator who I think I can safely predict their position would be uh, John Madigan. Mm. He's up for election this time. So he doesn't care? Well, a double dissolution make, halves the quota, 
so it increases his chances right. of getting re-elected. So I think he would probably favour a double dissolution. For the rest of us, we either face an election and a double dissolution or we have another three or four years uh, in the Senate, um, and in which, at the end of which, we either face a normal half Senate election or possibly a double dissolution at that point. So I suppose from our point of view, the, the best way to... Uh, it's sort of three years in the hand versus three years mm. in the bush. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference if you're satisfied that you're going to get re-elected. And it depends no. who we're talking about, doesn't it? Because, you know, someone like... Ricky Muir, I suspect, isn't coming back no matter what. Mm. But a Glenn Lazarus and a Jackie Lambie are probably better off with a, a, a halved quota DD election because even though it comes three years early, uh, you'd think they're a chance of surviving that, whereas it's hard to see them surviving with the new Senate rules if that quota's up over 14%. Mm. That's true, although... I, I, I hear this talk about uh, Jackie and Glenn surviving. There is zero polling data on that. Mm. Zero. So it's all speculation. I'm, I'm worried that something is being repeated a lot of times. And, and not and necessarily true. Therefore, it's assumed that it's true. Well, tell you what, it is true is Nick Xenophon. I mean, Nick Xenophon would want a double disillusion election. I'm not convinced that his name recognition when he's not on the ticket does as well for him as, as some people might think, whereas him being on the ticket, we know from the last election, with a halved quota, is going to give him three, you would yes. think. Yes, uh, you're quite right. Um, in fact, there, there is uh, uh, objective proof that when he's not on the ticket, the vote is nowhere near as high. His, his personal following is substantial. So, yes, he would have an interest in uh, double dissolution, although Nick is a bit of a one-man band. Um, he's... He calls himself the Nick Xenophon team, but he's not, if he's staff or anything to go by, he's not that enthusiastic about teamwork. He's, he's, a, he's a lone ranger. So um, whether or not he feels that strongly one way or the other, I'm, I wouldn't be convinced. Mm. It'll be interesting to see. I want to get your thoughts on uh, a policy matter. Bill Shorten has put the whole idea of a Royal Commission uh, into the banking sector on the table. He opposed it, of course, last year. Now he's in favour of it. Is this pure politics? And even if it is... What do you think of it as a policy idea? It's good politics. There, you know, bank bashing comes around about every five years or so. So, uh, you know, it's on prob cue. Probably time. Yeah, it's time for another bank bashing. There are people out there who are convinced that making money is a is a moral, mortal, uh, unforgivable sin, um, unless they're making it, of course. So, um, so there's a there's a cheer squad who will always join in the bank bashing, um, and. Um, so, uh, you know, the politics are fine. The reality of, you know, does it need it? Um, uh, the manipulation of the BBSW, which Westpac is accused of, they're denying it. Um, ASIC's already on to it. There is going to be some sort of prosecution or whatever. If Westpac pleads not guilty and defends itself, there's a possibility they'll, they'll be found they're not culpable at all. So what's the Royal Commission going to add to that is the question. Um, and that's the government's line to some extent. I mean, the government is the one saying ASIC's very powerful, it's got mm -hmm. powers equal, if not greater than a royal commission. They're arguing that they had their financial uh, inquiry that Labor never had, that they had, that they've taken all the recommendations from. Although that was a different thing. That was looking at the sure. effectiveness of the financial system rather than rorts and rackets and so forth. The question, I suppose, is are there any uh, people being harmed by the financial system, by the banks... Um, that is not already being dealt with and uh, by what's already in place. Are there any undiscovered um, bodies, if you like? What do you think? I, I don't think so. It's a highly regulated industry. That's not necessarily a good thing, but the idea that um, there are uh, rackets going on, that, that people are being ripped off and, and it's, nobody knows about it and a Royal Commission will discover that, I think that defies... Um, you know, the evidence. But I, what, see no, I see no reason to believe that that's true. But what goes around comes around, doesn't it? I mean, the government, uh, you couldn't say they were anything but political uh, in their motivations, uh, rightly or wrongly, around Pink Bat's Royal Commission and Trade Union Royal Commission, particularly given that the scope was well beyond the CFMEU. I mean, that's now where they seem to want to focus, but mm. that Trade Union Royal Commission went a lot wider afield than that. It did. There, was uh, a, there were a lot more unions. There were plenty more unions than just the CFMEU. And even, the, uh, even John Howard was critical of the politicisation of the Pink Bats Royal Commission. So, in a sense, what goes around comes around. Yes, it does. That's right, yeah. And you, you, you do need to be um, a little mindful of the cost of a Royal Commission. There are... Uh, it's a lawyer's picnic, an absolute lawyer's picnic, and often 
uh, you run the risk that the only beneficiaries from it will be lawyers, nobody else. What, what's it going to find we don't already know? Um, is it going to discover criminal behaviour we didn't know about? Most unlikely. You really have to sustain an argument that the existing um, regulatory bodies, if you like, are incompetent, asleep at the post, and that people are being ripped off and criminally ripped off um, and, and nothing's been done. Well, then the next question for you that I have <coughs> is, that argument would suggest that the populism of the politics around having a Royal Commission on the banks will hold for a period of time, but eventually, if you like, sanity might prevail. This idea that this is unnecessary, it's a, an incorrect attack on uh, the current regulators, it's an impost financially, it's, it's a two-year uh, period of, of uncertainty uh, for the financial sector, etc. Is there enough time for all of that to manifest for it to backfire on Bill Shorten or do you just simply see it as something that by the time we get to the next election this will be a positive for Labor because at least they're calling out the banks whereas Malcolm Turnbull only did it rhetorically and it was then outflanked by Bill Shorten last week? Mm. Um, my guess is that it'll probably benefit Labor uh, right through to the election although let's see if there's an election in July it won't have had time to fizzle out and, and disappear if there's not an election until October, which I think is unlikely, you could argue or people will be sick of it by now. And, you, and you're right, uh, these things can backfire. You look at the number of inquiries and the, number, the, the amount of moral outrage over petrol prices. There's always going to be an inquiry. Somebody's always, always being ripped off. It's got to be um, collusion. So they look at it and they find nothing. But there's still those screams about it. They look at it again, they find nothing. Eventually people say, OK, well, that's just the way it is. Petrol companies are bastards. I think probably, um, uh, uh, give it enough time, and I don't know how much time, and that's your point, mm. um, people will just say, yeah, banks are like that, they're bastards. So let's just get on with life and we can hate them without them uh, uh, concluding that they're they were ripping us all off. Well, we'll probably talk about this as well, but I'll see you uh, for Australian Agenda on Sunday on the eve of your return for the Senate sitting around the ABCC. I'll talk to you then. Thanks for your company. You're welcome. Thank you. It's David Lionhelm, crossbench, key crossbench senator, no less, coming up after the break here on...